Hi, I'm Dr. John DeYard, and welcome to the Life Spa Podcast. And this month, I want to talk about going back to school safely. You know, for our kids and for those of us at home, it's all about tolerating the exposure. And from the Ayurvedic perspective, there is exposure. We're all going to be exposed, constantly being exposed. And then there's our susceptibility. What we can do is we can become less susceptible. This was the premise of Ayurveda. You know, one of the premises is don't treat the disease, treat the person who has the disease. Don't kill the bacteria, bring the host back in the balance so the host doesn't allow the infection to populate. Now that's a tall order, but it's definitely the road to hoe for doing the best we can from a preventative perspective, right? So there are some things we can do. Our first line of defense is our mucous membranes particularly in our respiratory tract and our intestinal tract. And uh, studies now show that the intestinal skin, the lining of your intestinal tract and the microbiome there is intimately connected and bidirectionally related to the microbiome in lungs, in the respiratory tract. And they both support respiratory and gut immunity. Gut immunity is 70% of your immune response. So having really good, healthy skin, therefore, an environment or a host to support a healthy microbiome gives you 70% of your overall immune response. And that immune response is intimately and bidirectionally related to the respiratory microbiome or respiratory immunity, right? So how important it is for us to take care of the skin. Now, we all know that in the winter time, we are more vulnerable to getting sick. And, uh, and the mucous membranes of the respiratory tract can dry out. And this is something we have to protect against for our children. And uh, one of the things that happens when you're in a dry home with forced hot air, drying out the mucous membranes, is the mucous membranes dry out. And as a result, they produce reactive mucus. And that reactive mucus uh, is in a breeding ground for undesirable bacteria to proliferate. And that can create, you know, real problems. So one of the kind of the hallmarks of immunity is taking care of the host taking care of the environment. The right environment takes care, supports a healthy, stable of immune, you know, fighting microbiome or microbes. So it's really important for us to keep, make sure that environment is just right. Like the three little bears, if your respiratory tract or your gut is either too dry or too wet, it isn't just right. It has to be kind of that proper balance of mucus and dryness together, like sort of like the three little bears. And so one of the ways to do that in the winter is to antidote the extreme of the winter season, which is dryness. And that's where, you know, moisturizers, uh, particularly humidifiers, things like that, really important to start putting that in your kid's bedroom, you know, as early as August, you know, somewhere around mid-August, the, the heat of summer starts to build up to a point where it starts to turn to dryness and your skin starts to dry out, your sinuses start to dry out. And that's when you can start to antidote the dryness of the mucous membranes with something like a cool mist humidifier works really well. Ayurveda also recommends nausea oil, which are oils that uh, you, you drop into your nose and sniff those oils and lubricate your sinuses, which are also really, uh, really quite effective at keeping your sinuses from getting too dry or irritated from the, uh, from the dry extreme environment. Um, another thing that I, that I think uh, I absolutely you know, depended on when my kids were little, we raised six kids and when they were all young, I remember at one point we had all the kids lying down, all six of them you know, kind of in our bathroom floor um, and on their side and I would uh, mix up some ear oil and you can buy it locally. It's a, usually a mullion garlic ear oil. This is called Karna Pruna in Ayurveda and it's where you put oil, warm oil in the ears. And that supports the this lubrication of the eustachian tubes, which allows better cervical lymphatic drainage. And your immune system is carried by your, by your lymphatic system. So it's really important that stays patent or moving or supple or lubricated, right? So one of the classic ways to help kids fight off any you know, issue, immune event that's kind of that's creeping into their lives. And I found that you know, when kids, when they were young, they go to pool parties or swimming parties 
it was almost like invariable that night they're going to have a runny nose or the neck or, or, or start to feel like they're coming down with something. And one of the ways to mitigate that was to lie them on their side, take some of that, that warm mullion garlic ear oil, heat it up under the faucet, put, drop it on the inner arm, make sure it's just a little bit warmer, the room temperature, and then put them in and drop, you know, fill up their ear hole with that oil. And I would go drop and drop, 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 all six of them, lie there for a few minutes and they didn't like it, but I made them do it. And then, and then I would put a cotton ball in their ears and then flip them over and then do it again on the other side and the cotton ball and then they were good to go. I can't tell you the, the, uh, the, the, the benefit that, ha that, that gave us you know, raising six children uh, where the average kid gets like six colds per year, right? And uh, you know, if you get six colds per year and you got six kids uh, in each cold last two weeks, you're looking at an overwhelming amount of kids with colds in your house in your life. And it was just became sort of unacceptable behavior in our house. So we figured out ways to do it. And that's partly why I wrote the book Perfect Health for Kids, because I just wanted people to know there's stuff you can do to keep your kids healthy. They don't have to get sick. And, and luckily, um, you know, we really never had a lot of issues with them. But we did notice if you take the kids out and they get run down or worn out in a sleepover or they have an all day event and then they go to sleep over at night or something like that or go to a movie, eat pizza, or they go on a pool party. It's like it runs them down and it like their battery charge isn't, you know, adult size, it's baby size, child size. It doesn't give them the endurance that adults have. So they get run down, they get tired and they become immune compromised very, very quickly. So it's really important for a lot of reasons to make sure that, uh, that uh, we do the things to prevent. And the ear oil, another wonderful thing. The, uh, the, um, the other thing that I love is soluble fiber. You know, I wrote a couple of articles about getting the right fiber in the right season. If you think about the, the, what's being harvested in the winter time are fibers that are soluble, which means, which means slimy. Uh, they, they dissolve in water. Uh, slippery elm, um, you marshmallow root, licorice, chia seeds, flax seeds, okra, oatmeal, all these, when you mix them with water, they become very slimy and very slippery. Well, that's what you get in the fall, the grains and the seeds, and when you cook them or soak them in water, they become very slimy. Well, the, the extreme of the vata you know, season where most immune, immune events take place, right, is in the winter. So we're doing all these things to antidote the extreme of the season, which is, of course, you know, moisturizing, lubricating your ears, you know, humidifying, and as well as eating the soluble fiber, which is harvested in the fall for winter, you know, vata balancing lubrication. Really simple, but really profound. So you're adding more of that in the diet as well. And nature also, by the way, had a plan for this. And the plan was, of course, to, you know, um, provide us with a harvest that antidotes the extreme of that season, which is why squirrels eat nuts and seeds, and we have grains and legumes and beans and all these foods that are, have seeds in them, which are generally filled with oil, and they, became, they become very lubricating and very unctuous, which is a real important quality to antidote the vata and keep those mucous membranes healthy, not only in your respiratory tract, but also in your digestive tract as well. In the digestive tract, if the intestinal tract gets dried out and constipated, you're vulnerable, right? We now know that 94% that of the bile can get reabsorbed back to the liver if there's not enough fiber in the diet. The soluble fiber, as we just mentioned, that's, it's one of its jobs in life is to attack or to lubricate the intestinal skin. Another of its jobs is to feed the healthy microbiome. But another one of its jobs is to attach to the bile and take the bile to the toilet. Now we think of the bile from your liver, which is like a Pac-Man gobbling up toxins in your liver, cleaning out all the villi of your intestinal tract. It's loaded with toxins. But if you have enough fiber, soluble fiber in your diet, the fiber attaches to the bile and takes the bile and the toxins to the toilet. But if you don't have enough fiber in your diet, then 94% of that bile with all the toxins in tow gets reabsorbed back to the liver and congest your liver and creates real problems. And that can create toxicity. And that can also create, uh, in effect, really what it does is it creates toxicity, but even more importantly, I think it does, it affects the quality of your digestion. Because when the liver gets congested, it doesn't make the bile as efficiently as it could. And the bile can get sludgy or thick or viscous. And then the, and then the bile is an emulsifier for the fat. 
for the good fat to, deliver, to be delivered as energy and for the bad fat to be detoxified. But if the bile is thick and sluggish, you're not going to have that amount of bile to emulsify the good of the, or the bad fats. But the bile is also a buffer for the stomach acid. So your stomach will be reluctant to make the acid you need to cook the wheat and the dairy and the nuts and the seeds and the grains and all that stuff unless it has a good uh, amount of bile or buffers to neutralize that acid. So as soon as the acid leaves your stomach, it goes into the small intestine. It has to be buffered, neutralized. Otherwise, that acid will burn a hole through your intestinal tract and give you an ulcer, right? So that's why the bile and the pancreatic enzymes and duodenal enzymes are all natural buffers for that acid. But if your liver is congested because of constipation, sluggish elimination, then that can become a problem. That's where you want to really think, okay, I got to fix the constipation, but I also may want to also know how to decongest my liver and bile. And these are things that I wrote about in my digestive troubleshooting ebook that I would highly recommend that you read. It's free. And it talks about how to run a fine tooth comb of troubleshooting your digestion and your children's digestion. So you can pick up on what part of the digestion is going wrong. Constipation is easy, right? People can't go to the bathroom. They're having hard, more pellet-like stools and doing things like the soluble fiber are really important for that because that'll affect the whole, whatever, you know, the respiratory tract as well as the intestinal tract. So adding more of the, the, the okra, the oatmeal, the chia, the flax, the slippery elm, the marshmallow, right, the licorice. We have a formula called the slippery elm prebiotic, which is slippery elm, licorice, and marshmallow root. It's a really sweet tea, and you can make a tea out of it and give, your, give it to your kids uh, while they're having their food to create that nice vata balancing effect, which is uh, you know, really important. Um, also, triphala is also another herb to help tonify the bowel. We have a formula called Elim Number One, which has triphala and licorice and slippery elm in it that gives you that demulsion, slimy vata balancing effect. So it's not just a, a stringent scrub of the intestinal skin, which is what triphala is alone, but it adds the demulsion to make it more vata balancing and therefore much easier to wean off of so you're not on a pillar of powder to get your bowels to go for the rest of your life. So that's really important. And then simple things for your liver. And you know, if a kid gets tummy aches a lot, you want to be thinking, what's causing my child's tummy ache? So two things are the most common. One, the constipation issue, um, which leads to congestion of the liver. So how do we decongest the liver? Well, my favorite drink for that is called ABC juice. Uh, and uh, that means apple, beet, and celery. And I wrote an article about that too, recipes and how to make it all, but it's super simple. You can take a beet and apple celery, put it in a blender and blend it up, add a little water, drink it. You can juice them with a, you know, old fashioned style juicer. Um, you can put them in a pot and steam them and blend it, make a soup out of it. Uh, you can um, have them individually because they're all what's called cologogs. Cologogs to thin your bile and increase the bile flow. The more bile, the more poop. Bile is the regulator of your bowel function. So if the kid is constipated, you could add the soluble fiber, you could add the alim one, the triphala with the slippery almond licorice, or you could add a cologog, which treats it at a more upstream level by giving you beets and apples and celery. Uh, green drinks are also on that list of cologogs as well. That'll increase bile flow. Bile makes you poop at or bile. Also, not only more poop, but more stomach acid. So now all of a sudden, the body's saying, hey, there's bile down there. We can make as much acid as we want because we know somebody's going to put this fire out. So if I got to cook a ham sandwich, I better make darn sure there's a good amount of acid to be, uh, available to make this thing, to digest the, the, the gluten and the bread and the protein in the ham. But you also need to have bile to buffer that acid and you also need the bile to neutralize the fat in the ham, for example, right? So they all coordinate is the point here, and they're really, really important to coordinate them. The other factor that can cause this is dehydration. Kids are chronically dehydrated. They just don't get enough water. And, uh, you know, I think it was in 1850, the average kid, American rather, drank one pop or soda per year. Now kids, on average, eat and drink two per day, right? So it's just a crazy difference to what it used to be like and what it is today. And we don't drink as much water. 
So water is obviously very hydrating and it's really important. Now the stomach lining is layered or buffered with a bicarbonate layer that's 94 to 95% water. So if you're not drinking enough water and that, buffer, that bicarbonate layer is dehydrated, it's not going to buffer the acids. Your stomach simply won't make the acid and therefore you're going to have an issue where you just don't feel like you want to eat, you're not hungry, or your tummy hurts. And that happens commonly with kids. So the first thing that you should do if your child has a tummy ache is to give them some water, which is really important as well. And what you can do instead of giving it to them with the meal, give it to them a half hour before the meal. So it prehydrates the stomach lining. And then when you start eating the food a half an hour later, stomach's going like, oh my gosh, this is great. There's all this you know, there's this water, it's been hydrated, there's tons of buffers here. Stomach can make as much acid as it needs to cook the food, which is, um, you know, really, really important. You know, dehydration in kids has been linked to a host of in conditions and it's really insidious because you don't really kind of know it's there, but from stomach aches to weight gain to fatigue to mood swings to focus issues to skin and hormonal problems, uh, it's a really, really uh, important thing the you know, average adult loses about two to three quarts of water per day. Um, and a decrease in body weight, which that easily would do, just by 2% reduces the child's athletic ability by 25%. So it's really important to think, think about trying to drink you know, in the tune of you know, half your ideal body weight in ounces of water per day. And the lymphatic system, which carries your immune system, is really dependent on hydration. You do not want to have, you know, uh, dehydration or lack of hydration in the circulatory lymphatic system, which moves specifically based on the science. It's really dependent on proper hydration and how important that is. Another thing that's really important for kids going back to school is going to bed early. I can't emphasize this enough for your children. You know, I think kids, uh, kids, uh, want to stay up late. They've got their phones and their pads and different things. And I, I, I would also highly recommend that you create some rules that are um, unambiguous around cell phone and technology where uh, what we did in our house was we had the Wi-Fi would get shut off at 10 o'clock at night. So it was over. Uh, cell phones were plugged in in the kitchen and uh, they didn't have those in their bed where they could text at 2 or 3 in the morning. You wake up in the morning, look at your kid's phone, and you'll see all these texts that came in, you know, at two or three in the morning. It's unbelievable. So uh, just don't expose your kid to that, not to mention the blue light from the LED screen that actually, you know, very directly uh, blocks the, uh, the melatonin. And melatonin is one of the most powerful immune agents that we have. Um, really important to make sure that there's no LED lights in the room, there's no screens in the bedroom, and it's actually really, really dark. Because even the littlest bit of light, they, one study showed just a little bit of light coming under the crack of the door actually blocked melatonin. And that's interesting because we know that sunrise um, is, is the first sunrise, that's the first rays of the sun block melatonin because at night you have melatonin to help you sleep and detoxify and rebuild. As soon as the sun rises, melatonin gets shut down, right? And um, so, so what's interesting about that is that um, the, the, the morning sunrise, there's very, very little blue light. It doesn't make, take a lot of blue light to shut down melatonin. The sunrise isn't blue, it's orange and red, right? So it's different. And I've written some articles about the circadian impact of sunrise and sunset if you want to know more about that. It's really a fascinating science, but the point is, is very little blue light, very little screen time um, can actually block your melatonin. Now, during the day, you can get away with it because you're actually trying to block the blue light a little bit, but at the same time, you don't want, we're not wired and haven't had the, the evolutionary time to adapt to so much direct blue light from LED screens to our eyes. And studies show it actually can cause some retinal damage and in, is also in studies with fruit flies, which are actually, believe it or not, weirdly in the scientific world, similar to humans, they actually show that it caused some brain damage and locomotion damage. So it's really important to not have that exposure. So getting blue light blocker glasses, um, putting your screen on uh, night filter 
24 seven is what I do on my phone. So I'm not looking at a blue light really ever. Gotta just get more, I'm just more exposed to the light that's naturally available, which I think you know is really, really important. Um, so that's really important. Um, the other thing, uh, the other thing that's important with uh, with nighttime is you know getting to bed early. At 10 o'clock at night, the the pitta, the liver becomes active, and uh, that creates a level of stimulation that can keep your kid up for you know hours and hours and hours. So now they're not going to bed till two or three in the morning. But at eight o'clock, at 8:30 ish you know, between eight and 10, there's gonna be a time where we all feel a little sleepier and we fall asleep. It's so classic, people are watching TV on the couch, they fall asleep at eight o'clock, they wake up at 10 o'clock and they're up till midnight, right? This is because this is a circadian clock, that liver time between 10 o'clock and two is supposed to put you to sleep and you're supposed to be asleep and it's supposed to detoxify you, but if you're up at that time, then the liver activation just stimulates you, wakes you up and makes you, sort of wires you for sound and next thing you know, you're you're up watching TV or you know, you know, changing the world on the internet or, or working or studying or whatever. And uh, it really does disturb your biological clocks, which need to be in rhythm with the, with the natural clocks, which is why um, melatonin is really important. And for kids, um, a lack of melatonin from staying up late has been linked to anxiety issues. And circadian medicine and circadian rhythm and balances have been linked to anxiety issues. So one of the ways to hack that is to get the screens out of the bedroom, go to bed early. You know, sometimes if they just can't go to sleep, we have something called low dose melatonin where one drop is 0.1 milligram, a drop or two for your child to help them get that, re that reset that biological clock for them is a great way to help get them back into rhythm. Another way to get them back into, into rhythm and don't think, don't, 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 don't uh, um, forget that you know, your circadian clocks in sync with the circadian rhythms of nature are a big part of our immune response. And a study at CU Boulder, a couple of them found that people would go away who they measured their circadian rhythms and their melatonin was all over the place, surging in the middle of the day. They were tired in the middle of the day. They needed coffee to make it through the day. They took them up into the mountains. No sun, no, no cell phones, no lights, no artificial light whatsoever, just up with the sun, in bed with the sun and they reset their circadian clock 100% in just seven days. They followed up with another group for just the weekend and uh, they reset their circadian clock by 68%, which is pretty crazy, right? So you can do a, and I wrote an article about this called No Artificial Light Weekend. Why not? Turn the Wi-Fi off, turn your cell phone off, turn the lights out, don't use any electricity. Easy to do in the summer, light some candles in the evening, don't watch any TV, read some books to each other and just get off the grid for a weekend. It'll reset the circadian clock for you and your children by 68%, which is you know, really phenomenal, really. And then the other thing about sleep, the other thing that you wanna know is that you know, we walk around all day long, we're talking to people, and we're breathing in a lot of times through our nose and our mouth, and whatever we breathe in isn't always wonderful, right? That's why we wear masks during pandemics and things like that. And, um, and so, Nature had that sort of figured out. They had a plan for that. And, uh, and, it, and at nighttime, when people would go to sleep, traditionally they were trained as babies to breathe through their nose when they would sleep. And when you breathe through your nose when you sleep, you produce a gas, a Nobel Prize winning gas, I should say, in 1998 won the Nobel Prize in chemistry as the panacea molecule that cured everything. So when you breathe through your nose, uh, you produce the nitric oxide gas. When you breathe through your mouth, you produce zero. Well, nitric oxide is one of the most powerful antiviral gases, antiseptic gases we know of. So when you actually are out talking and breathing through the day, you're exposing your lungs and respiratory tissues and respiratory microbiome to a host of all these types of bacteria and viruses and whatever. Then you lie in bed, you close your mouth, and you breathe through your nose, and you're washing your respiratory tract with this powerful antiviral, antibacterial gas nitric oxide, all about, all very naturally and very, very effortlessly. You're gonna be there for eight hours lying there anyway, why not get the best of it? So teach your children to lie on their side, chuck their chin, um, and uh, teach them how to become nose breathers. I did a podcast with a woman who, who uh, called Sharon Moore, who wrote a book called uh, Sleep Wrecked Kids or how not sleeping properly with their mouths open can destroy them 
in a psychological but also in a cognitive way. It's really, really important how we sleep and with our mouth closed. I wrote another article called, I think, the 20 scientific reasons why we should tape our mouths closed when we sleep. And I, and I would look at yourselves and your children. If you're looking for immune support, you want to make sure your, your kids are sleeping with their mouth closed. Now, a lot of times you're like, I don't know if their mouths are closed because I'm sleeping too. Well, you, there are apps you can get, sleep apps, or you call sleep apnea apps, really, or snoring apps, and you just put it next to the child's bed, and then it'll record all the breathing events that take place. So you can listen to it in the morning so, and hear your child whether they were quiet or snoring or loud. Sleep should be quiet. It shouldn't be snoring. Your kid shouldn't be gasping. Um, so you want to make sure that that's, that's you know, not happening if it's your child, which means their mouth is open and not getting that benefit. So it's a cumulative uh, you know, benefit of doing this, and you can tape your mouth closed, their mouth closed, or your mouth closed if you have issues with snoring. That even if you didn't know you were snoring, you don't really know until you put a tape recorder on or, uh, or the, the breathing app or the sleeping app on, or you put some tape on your mouth. And I'm not talking about duct tape or scotch tape. I'm talking about the one I love is a really inexpensive tape called, made by 3M called Micropore. And it's one for sensitive skin and it's blue. And you can take one piece of tape and put it right over there, just like that, and it'll keep your mouth closed. Now, if that tape is on the wall or thrown out of the bed somewhere by morning, you know that uh, you tore it off and uh, it wasn't comfortable for you. But over time, I promise you, it'll get comfortable. You get comfortable with your jaw closed. And this is really important for your child's facial development too because when the mouth is closed, the tongue gets stuck to the roof of the mouth. It widens the palate and significantly opens the airways. And that means open the airways for brain respiration to help the brain drain the three pounds of plaque and junk that we dump out of our head through the glymphatic system every year while we sleep. But if you're not draining very, very well, the brain lymph will get congested and the, the airways get smaller and the jaw gets longer and more narrow and you get facial structure issues. You get a jaw that's too small for wisdom teeth and you get smaller airways and less cognitive performance. And that's all been well documented, documented in articles that I've written about it in Sarah Moore's book, Sleep Right Kids. Uh, James Nestor talked about that to a, certain, to a certain extent in his book called Breath. I did a podcast with James as well. All these things really, really important. So just, you know, to put it, get the app, find, just put it next to your, your kid's bed and make sure they're quiet because you don't know what you don't know. And you don't know if you snore or not. I ask everybody, I ask all my patients, do you snore at night? And they go, no. And then usually in the background, I'll hear the wife or the husband go, oh, yes, you do, you know, because because we don't know, right? We're asleep. So that's a, a really important and really important thing as well. Um, another thing is um, how to feed your kids um, when they go back to school. And I always talked about, you know, the lunch at school was like the big miracle, the big mystery. Nobody really knew what the kids ate. You would pack a lunch for them. It would come home somewhat, you know, all the times missing. All the food was gone, uh, sometimes half gone, sometimes not gone. You never really knew what happened at lunch, you know, at school time lunches. So what we would do is we would actually um, prepare a really big meal. My wife would prepare a nice big meal. I'd come home from work and we'd have lunch together <clears throat> at around 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock or something like that. I'd go back to work. The kids come home at 3 o'clock and on the stove is all this food that has just been cooked. So when they come home from school, as we all know, the kids are starving and they want a snack. And the historical way of doing it was give them a snack, like a milk and cookie snack or something like that. And um, that's just sugar which means it's going to amp up their blood sugar and what goes up comes crashing down and next thing you know, they're, they're, they're now having a blood sugar low right after you're trying to get them to do their homework, which they don't really want to do when their blood sugar is crashing. So it just sort of became sort of uh, miserable to try to get the kids to focus after school if you didn't give them anything but real food. So what was really interesting was when we would give them a plate of you know, Indian food or, or vegetables or, you know, really good healthy meal, <clears throat> they would gobble it down like it was a snack. And it would give them blood sugar stability. And the kids with six kids, they weren't fighting with each other or not wanting to do their homework or all these things didn't happen. And it was sort of a miracle. So it really cuts that, that afternoon craving, gives them blood sugar stability, 
And then by early supper, by five, six, seven o'clock, we could all sit down and have a light supper. They would eat again more substantially. I've already had my big meal a day, and I might have a light supper, but it's more of a social time <clears throat> as a parent than a, you know, don't talk to me, I gotta eat my food because I've been starving all day kind of feeling as the parent. So the parents play a big, big role in this as well, making sure that you feed yourself well so you can take care of others, sort of like the oxygen mask in the airplane. You know, you take care of yourself and then take care of somebody else. You have to make sure that you're fed, taken care of, make sure your immune system <clears throat> is strong. Otherwise, you're not gonna be good for anybody else, which I think uh, is really, really important. Um, the other thing that I think is really important for uh, back to school immunity and going back to school, you know, healthfully is exercise, making sure your kids get plenty of exercise. And as you know, I wrote a book called Body, Mind, and Sport. And it's all about nose breathing exercise. And, all, and we published studies on the benefits of nose breathing versus mouth breathing. We published those studies back in the early 90s. Um, so I'm still a massive fan of the benefits of your nose versus your mouth. When children get stressed, they, they breathe in the upper chest. And school, you know, is stressful. Who am I going to sit down with, lunch, eat lunch with? And are my kid friends going to be nice to me? I mean, I, we raised six kids. You guys all know how stressful it is for kids when they go to school. Even the kids that, you know, you know every, all of our kids thought all the other kids were having the best time and, and they were the only ones having trouble. Well, it turns out they're all having trouble because it's stressful. Social interaction, being, have, getting friends, friends being mean without meaning it, but they do. And uh, that makes kids feel on guard. They start to shallow breathe. <clears throat> and then on top of shallow breathing, we're sitting and we're slunging in a chair and that drives the rib cage into the upper abdomen where the diaphragm is and forces the diaphragm into a downward pre-contracted position. So the diaphragm really can't in that position fully contract and breathe the air in and fully expand the lungs. So the rib cage sort of gets tighter and tighter and tighter because it's always in exhale mode. The rib cage is always trying to squeeze the air out. It has something called elastic recoil, and it forces us to start to shallow breathe. The receptors in the upper chest are fight or flight. Last thing your kids need more of is fight or flight messaging. When you're breathing 25, 6,000 times per day, if you're shallow breathing and you're <sighs> then all of a sudden you're telling your body life's a you know, full-blown emergency every single day of the year, and um, which can be reversed by teaching them how to breathe properly. And, um, and that's where the nose comes in. The nose is a smaller turbinate, turbinates or smaller tubes that drive air through these turbines, these turbinates, to drive the air all the way into the lower lobes of your lungs and fully inflate the rib cage. And then as soon as you, the diaphragm relaxes, the rib cage contracts and breathes the air out. And, um, and uh, so nose breathing is really important. So, you know, uh, nose breathing exercise, nose breathing going for walks, nose breathing while you go to sleep. I mean, I know you probably heard me say this a lot, but nose breathing is really important and particularly important for the development of the brain and the face and the structure of the head. Um, it's really, really important. And one thing you can do when you go for walks and hikes with your kids, which is a fun exercise, is to say, okay, we're gonna breathe through our nose and we're gonna count our steps, okay? And see how many steps I can take for each inhale and each exhale. So I said, we're gonna try to do one, two, three, four steps on the inhale. One, two, three, four steps on the exhale. And they're like, totally got that, no problem. So okay, now we're gonna take it to 10 on the inhale and 10 on the exhale. And they'd be like, super proud of themselves because they were able to do that. And then we're going to say, okay, now that you're 10 on the inhale and 10 on the exhale, we're going to keep the 10 on the inhale, but I want 15 or 20 on the exhale, right? So now you do, you do that and they're like, that might be more challenging for them. And, um, but as you lengthen the exhalation, you're doing something called building what's called CO2 tolerance. And in Ayurveda, they, they use techniques called kumbhak or breath holding or in Western medicine called intermittent hypoxia, where you hold your breath and allow the, the, the oxygen in the blood to become a little bit hypoxic for a very short period of time. But that very short period of time creates all these medical health benefits, including increasing stem cells, boosting immunity, increasing nitric oxide. You know, the hormone that Lance Armstrong got busted for injecting, you make yourself when you literally hold your breath or build what's called CO2 tolerance. Um, 
It uh, has been shown to increase endothelial growth factors to protect your arterial lining. Uh, certain transcription factors called the, the guardian of your genome to protect your genes from expressing negative traits, which they do when you're stressed out, right? So when you see your kids you know, becoming more and more vulnerable to uh, autoimmune type conditions, you wonder where do these things come from? There often comes from you know, slow accumulation of stress, possibly affecting how you breathe, and then the breathing affecting the function of your diaphragm, and diaphragm creating upper chest breathing, and they alter the natural ratios between oxygen, CO2, and nitric oxide. I know I'm throwing a lot at you here, but I've written a bunch of articles about this and how really important it is. So when you take those steps and you lengthen the exhale, CO2 levels begin to rise because you're holding your breath or trying to extend the length exhale longer. And when they rise, the bond between the, CO, the oxygen and the hemoglobin in your blood becomes weaker and the CO2 is released, uh, or the oxygen that's tightly bound to the hemoglobin in your blood is released into your tissues, and it actually he, you know, restores oxygenation of the tissues. Where if you, if you are a shallow breather, and the rib cage is constantly becoming cage-like and tighter on the rib cage, um, you end up having tons more oxygen, it's called over-breathing, and one study showed that most people shallow breathe and they breathe in 75% of the oxygen that they breathe in, right? They breathe out unused. So we're extremely inefficient, keep trying to jam in more oxygen into our respiratory tract, but there's no place for it to go, so we breathe it right back out. And the more oxygen we try to jam in, the tighter the bond between the oxygen and the hemoglobin in your blood becomes and the less oxygen you have in your tissues, and that causes something called tissue hypoxia, which means your tissues don't have the oxygen, but your blood is loaded up. So when you hold your breath a little bit and build the natural CO2 tolerance that we were designed to have, all of a sudden the oxygen floods your tissues and you rejuvenate the body at a really deep level, turn off the alarm bells. And, and you don't have to do it a lot, but, but just as a, as a reference, you know, the record right now for free diving you know, divers who breathe, uh, hold their breath going deep into the ocean, underwater, the record is 25 minutes holding your breath. You know, we're talking about holding your breath for 30 seconds to a minute, you know, and you'll, you'll slip into some intermittent hypoxia. So, so most of us are just become so inefficient. And like I said, when you're, when you're breathing through your nose, you're producing nitric oxide, which is a very powerful antiviral gas, and it supports not only facial and brain development, but also brain respiration, dumping the trash out, which is uh, you know, really, really critically important. Okay, so um, the other thing I wanna talk about is college kids. You know, College kids, it's back to school for them too. And I really feel like college has become sort of a crapshoot. It's, it's you know, whether they come out unscathed or not is just the luck of the draw. You know, they're exposed to you know, late nights, constant immune compromises. College kids get sick significantly more than other kids do. They're under a huge amount of stress and pressure. <coughs> Excuse me. Constantly cramming for, you know, studies and assignments and things like that. They eat bad food. I just have, after a sixth kid, I've yet to see a college that serves decent food that the kids can actually thrive on. Some are better than others, but none of them are great. Um, and then they, to help them deal with the stress, they party, which none of that really works. And it can lead to conditions like acne and asthma and breathing issues and insomnia and constipation and hormonal issues uh, and mood and stress, anxiety, depression concerns. I treat a lot in my practice where kids just are not thriving in college. So it's really important to understand that, that we need to have some semblance of circadian balance when we go away to school. You know, and uh, you know, one of those things is to go to bed early. And I remember I gave a, a lecture at CU Boulder, and, and uh, I told the kids to go to bed at 10 o'clock, and they looked at me like I was crazy. Like, you really seriously think we're going to go to bed at 10 o'clock? And I realized that I was probably not going to really make a dent here. So, you know, I, we had to figure out other strategies, right? You, you know, so maybe we're not going to go to bed at 10 o'clock, but you can still, maybe during the day, take some cat naps, get, get some naps in, get the sleep the very best you can. You know, it's okay to just come home from a class and take a nap if you're up till one o'clock in the morning, you know, um, studying or cramming or, you know, that kind of thing. I think that's really important. I think the other thing that kids do 
in colleges, they take a lot of stimulants to give them the energy to stay up till two or three in the morning. And there's no shortcut here. When you take a stimulant, you're making, you're driving your body to make energy it doesn't have, and that creates a debt. And you have to pay that back, that, that debt back eventually, somehow, some way, whether it be coffee or Adderall or energy drinks or stimulants or whatever, you're gonna have to pay that debt back. So it's important not to get, let yourself get into that routine. If you gotta study late, you know, you know, study late, or go to bed early, wake up in the morning and study, or do the best you can to study. It's just choices that you make, and a lot of us just procrastinate, end up with a big mass amount of work to do at the last minute, then we need all this energy support. So it's preparation, but if you know that the, I mean, I can't tell you how many patients that I've had over the years to say, boy, I really, you know, partied and pushed it really, really hard in college, now they're 35 years with a host of chronic health concerns. You just gotta know that it's just not sustainable, that kind of lifestyle or behavior. You know, bad food, there's many ways you can fix bad food. You can, you can get, you know, you know uh, instant pots where you can cook your own food. You can time it where, you know, your class is over at six. You could have that crock pot start cooking your beans and your rice and your dinner at four, and by six it's boom, ready for you to eat. And wouldn't that feel better, you know, to eat something that's ready to go when you write when you want it versus not having anything ready to go, so you need something instant and quick like a pizza and a Coke or something, which fills you up and satisfies you, but it's not gonna support you on a nutritional level, and it's, you know, it's a challenge for us to digest all that refined processed food. It creates issues, and there's tons of good science you know, behind that. Um, so those are some things that to, to really think about. And then things to help de-stress you. Having, some, having an arsenal of things that I recommend for, you know, for going back to school. Ashwagandha, really powerful, named after its ability to help people sleep, called withania somifera. It crosses the blood-brain barrier, supports cognitive function, mood stability, uh, a powerful immune support, immune tonic. Maybe the most studied adaptogen on the planet is ashwagandha. And the ones that we use are well, whole herbs, so they're not extracts of extracts that are super highly potent, that are overruling your body's intelligence, where, you can be where the body becomes tolerant to it, or you become dependent on it. We use, these are plants that are ground up, right out of the ground, put into a capsule, or just like they were thousands of years ago, eaten as foods and soups and stews or salads. It's really important to know, I believe, that the, you know, the whole herbs do provide an inoculation of the gut with the right bugs, you know, that change from season to season. Whole herbs are loaded with beneficial bacteria. All plants are, but extracts are sterile. So if you want to continue to try to support microbial diversity, which is linked to greater immunity, you want to keep open, expand, exposing your kids, yourself, you know, with uh, more diverse microbiome bugs, you know, microbes for your microbiome. Ashwagandha, phenomenal for energy during the day. You can take the same herb before you go to bed and sleep like a baby, which is amazing. Very few herbs can say that, where they can give you energy and get help you sleep all at the same time, which is pretty neat. So ashwagandha is a really great one. One of my favorite immune tonics that I've used for decades and decades is something called chayavamprash. Chayavamprash is made from amalaki. Amalaki is a vitamin C rich citrus uh, uh, berry which is a powerful immune tonic, the highest pound for pound source of vitamin C on the planet. And what the vitamin C in the amalaki does, it doesn't just give you vitamin C benefits, where it's the immune benefits and all that. It actually is an antioxidant to protect your fats, your vitamin D, A, D, E, and K from becoming rancid. And in the wintertime, when it's cold and dry, the fats dry out, they become more rancid, or you're not getting enough of them in your diet and they can, become, they can become toxic and rancid for you. But the vitamin C has been shown to, and this is where even more citrus fruits in the diet in the winter really does make sense. That's why they're harvested in the, in the winter time. We get all of our grapefruits and oranges, right? Things like that in the winter time. And that's because they, they have the vitamin C that are protectors of the fat soluble vitamins, which balance your vata, which support immunity, particularly in the winter time, which is, uh, which is really, I think, really, really important. So the Chayavon Prash, a powerful immune tonic. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a superfood that all these herbs have been slow cooked for, for a couple of days to really 
we will allow the nutritional value to be intact, but also be cooked and bioavailable to support you as a sort of an Ayurvedic multi-mineral, multivitamin immune support you know, agent. So really good. A couple of teaspoons or a tablespoon after each meal is a great way to go. You know, like I said, triphala, a great agent to help move the bowels. It's also been shown to be an, an immunomodulator, which means that helping your bowels function, uh, those same herbs support a healthier immune response. We all know that an overzealous immune response can cause problems and, um, and inflammation and things like that, where there are certain herbs that are immunomodulators that support that. Triphala is one of those. Neem is another immunomodulator. Neem has also been shown to, to bust biofilm and make sure that there's no, you know, these biofilms like plaque on your teeth is a biofilm, that these bad bacteria accumulate and proliferate and become kind of overwhelmingly, you know, uh, propagating your intestinal tract. And the neem is something that kind of mitigates the biofilm, but it's also a natural immunomodulator as well. Vitamin D, you got to know that vitamin D is one of the most important uh, and, uh, immune boosting agents. Uh, in the wintertime, we don't get a lot of vitamin D uh, because the sun is too low in the sky. Uh, even in the sum summertime in the morning, there's no vitamin D. It's just midday rays. So it's hard to get enough vitamin D. And they did one study with vitamin D and killer T cells, and they found that the killer T cells didn't engage in battle until their little vitamin D gas tank was 100% full. At 50% full, it didn't engage. So we need vitamin D as part of our powerful immune response. If you don't have enough vitamin D, you're going to pay a price. And you want on a blood test to be in the range of 50 to 80 nanograms per milliliter. That's the magic number. Uh, in the Western medicine, anything over 30 is normal. But ideally, you want to be between 50 and 80. And that usually takes about, you know, for kids, 2,000 to 3,000 international units per day. Uh, and if they're getting a lot of sun in the summertime, they generally don't even need it. But uh, during the winter, 2,000 to 3,000 adults more on the four to 5,000 um, you know, number as well. So those are some of the ones that I highly recommend. My favorite sort of immune event herb is something we call immunoblast. It's got mushrooms, colloidal silver, echinacea, golden seal, flowering plants, all powerful immune boosters. It's our most potent you know, response to an immune event that uh, I always keep on hand so I can, you know, when you get the first sign of an immune event, you can hit it really hard and see if you can turn it around in its track, get your body to really gear up so it can have that immune response that we're all, that we're all looking for. So there you have it. It's back to school time. What are the things to do to help you? Well, we talked about a bunch of them. I hope I didn't overwhelm you. A lot of this information is in my book, Perfect Health for Kids. And I've written a lot of articles on back to school as well. I wrote an article on back to school for kids. I wrote an article on back to college for kids. So please check out those articles at thelifespa.com. Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. John Deere. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by LifeSpa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at LifeSpa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.